Do that okay. And back to work we go. And I, where's Amanda? She's in Idaho or some crazy thing, right? I Am don't I, know, actually. She's, yeah, I think she went completely like you know, <laughs> off the grid. I, I know she's uh, she's in my my heart here recently because for years, I mean, we haven't done it in 10 years, but for years when she was growing up and even, you know, probably more than a teenager, but teenage, probably 10 years, we did Thanksgiving and Christmas two together. So mm -hmm. Facebook, you know, Facebook shows those pictures again. Yeah. There, you know, here's their 10. I go, oh my God, that was 10 years ago. Oh my God. <laughs> Okay, so special features of mutual funds. So we said the number one reason people buy mutual funds is to get professional management, right? I mean, who knows more about managing money, BlackRock or Joe Sixpack? Now, BlackRock, so this is a way to avail that. Now, in the mutual fund side of that business, right, this is a way for those folks to get access to that. And we said professional management, diversification, ease of ownership. Okay, so if we didn't have this next thing, again, this is testable. If we didn't have subchapter M of the tax code, what would happen is the corporation would make money, pay a tax on its earnings, pay a dividend to the shareholders who would then pay the tax, and then the uh, fund would distribute that to the shareholder. My God, the money would get taxed three times. So Chevron makes money, pays taxes. A BlackRock mutual fund owns Chevron. And then they uh, would pay taxes and then pay that out to the shareholder. We pay tax again. The IRS has been kind enough to say that as long as the mutual fund passes through 90% of its net investment income, they've been kind enough to say they'll wait and get that from the shareholder. Now, I think a great mnemonic for this is die 90. Die 90 is a way to remember how this works, right? So the dividends from the stocks in the portfolio plus the interest on the bonds in the portfolio, plus the expenses, we're gonna pay out 90%. So a good way to remember it is die 90. Now we have another investment that's very similar. It provides professional management, it provides diversification, and it too passes through 90% of its net investment income. You know that other investment vehicle that is kind of like this? Is it a DPP? It's a REIT. A REIT. Okay. I always get those ones confused. That's okay. That's okay. So not going to be a lot of questions on that, but let's just briefly talk about the testable distinction. In a direct participation program, Sophie, testable, you have flow through of both profits and losses. So a direct participation program known as a partnership, you're going to have a flow through of both. These, that's the only one, by the way, where there's a flow through of the profits and losses. That's it. None of the other things work like that. And so in mutual funds and, and REITs, it's not flow through of profit and losses. It's flow through of income only. Right? So just be careful when you're reading that question. So uh, that's a common thing, by the way. I don't know if you should feel any better. It's a common thing people get confused about, but, you know. Let's make sure you're unconfused. <laughs> yeah, and RELPs are fall under DPPs, right? They're limited partnerships. Uh, I'm sorry? RELPs fall DPPs. under DPPs. Yeah, I love it. Real, yeah, that's what it, RELP stands for, Real Estate Limited Partnership. Okay. That's what the LP is for, right? So we'll, we'll be, you know, maybe we'll get that. Maybe we'll get there today. Maybe we won't. Uh, by the way, only it's like margin. So me was making some smart decisions here as we come down to back nine. I'm so pleased that you didn't say what a burn up, uh, you know, an hour of margin. Listen, I just had somebody spend, you know, got an hour tutoring and all we did was stuff she's never going to see on the exam. I mean, I don't mind. It's her money. She went long the tutoring session, right? She paid the premium. It's her yeah. choice. But, uh, you know, I wish, you know, she would have, there were other things I think would have been more productive. But hey, I told you once you get it, though, you get it. So partnerships are very similar. So two, three questions max on partnerships, two, three on margin. So you really want to stay on the broad, broad avenues and highways uh, where you can get lots of points, right? So that previous hour was target rich and this is target rich too, right? So we're not talking about anything that, you know, is not something that, you know, you're going to be able to get some points on. Okay. And I think, you, like I recall, you know, we don't mean many points here, right? Now, there are some disadvantages of mutual funds. So let's just talk about uh, if I bought uh, Google at the IPO price of 85, I wish. And... You know, Fidelity bought, you know, 10% uh, of Google at the IPO price, and they still own 10% of Google. Wow. 
Now, as an individual investor, Sophie, I am in control of the tax consequences of my investments. The capital gains tax is a transaction-based tax. And the easiest way not to pay it is not to transact. Now, if I'm just sitting there and watching my Google stock go up, that's not taxable. What's taxable is I then say, I'm going to sell it. Right? And then we take the proceeds minus the cost base, and I owe taxes, either long-term or short-term. Now, while my investment mind might say sell, my tax mind says, oh, my God, if I sell that stock, I got a huge capital gains tax. And I could choose to you know, not. In a mutual fund, I'm not deciding when it is time to sell a security. Right? In a BlackRock mutual fund, it's going to be the portfolio manager that decides when to sell. And that means I could get end up with a capital gains distribution. So the long term is going to be distributed no more than annually. So if I'm in a BlackRock mutual fund and the portfolio manager sells, those capital gains distributions are going to be sent to me. Now, remember this, even if I reinvest them, I still owe what? Taxes, right? Even if I say BlackRock, I don't need the money, just put it back in the fund. I owe taxes on that. Now, it, the holding period, so remember, you're at risk for more than 12 months. You qualify for a long-term capital gain. And so the holding period is determined by how long the mutual fund has had the security. So if the BlackRock mutual fund has had it for 12 months or uh, more than 12 months, it's a long-term capital gains distribution, and I owe taxes at that rate. And if the fund has had it for 12 months or less, it's going to be a short term. So as it says here in our little uh, slide, that is determined by the holding period of the fund, right? Mm -hmm. Long-term or short-term. Now, if I redeem, so remember, I can anytime I want say, hey, you know, it's been a good ride, but I'm out. I want to redeem shares. Remember that redemption is always going to be based on the next calculation of the NAV. And that is going to be based on my holding uh, period of the fund shares themselves. So if I bought the mutual fund and I've been at risk for more than 12 months, it's a long-term capital gain. If I bought the mutual fund and I have not been at risk for more than 12 months, it's a short-term gain. You know, one of the biggest things we can do for people, you know, most people get where they go without crashing and burning financially, at, you know, dollar cost averaging in a mutual fund. So I say, hey, uh, Sophie, do you have fixed dollars you can invest regularly? Can you give me like a hundred bucks a quarter? You know, the neat thing about dollar cost averaging, Sophie, is you'll end up with a lower average cost of the underlying shares because you're going to be doing exactly what you should be doing, which is buying more shares when they're low and less shares when they're high. And so you I, I got a question on that and I on the test and I was sitting there trying to think the distinction was between the words cost and price. Yeah. Like which okay. would it so be, let's, which would be lower? Right. And so I, let's just do it's, it's definitely on the test. So let's just slow down here. We want to, you know, hoover up all the questions we can. So I was talking about taxes, but before we do that, let's just uh talk about dollar cost averaging because this is where this comes up most often. So there are three test questions about dollar cost averaging. The first is what makes it work. So for this to work, and I told you this is a, you know, this is a go-to move to get where you're going financially, right? Dollar cost average. I need to get the client to agree to give me fixed dollars invested regularly. So that's what will make this thing, put this thing in motion. $200 every month or $200 every quarter, whatever the case may be. It makes sense also because not testable, but you know, a lot more people get money in drips and drabs and they get like a lump sum. I mean, it's more likely I'm going to be able to bump into somebody who has $50 a month or $100 a month or whatever the case may be. And then test question number two is we're going to end up with a lower average cost. And this sounds like what you got jammed up on than the underlying share. So are we going to have a lower average cost than the average share price? And our last test question is that doesn't guarantee a profit. I'm going to show you an example here in just a sec. And that's our third test question. And I'm running out of space here. Let me just make a smaller font. That will take care of that. There we go. Boom. And then our third thing was we never, by the way, there's two nasty words we never use in the securities industry. One of them is approve and the other is guarantee. So we don't ever tell somebody that there's a guarantee or approve. 
So let's say you give me $100 every quarter. So task question number one, we have now set this in motion. And remember, you're, uh, you're investing at the public offering price. And so let's say that when you give me that first $100, uh, the share price, the public offering price is $10. And so you get 10 shares. And let's say uh, the next time you give me $100, uh, the share price is uh, $5. And you get 20 shares. Now, as I said, that's kind of a nifty thing. You're doing exactly what you should be doing which is buying less shares when they're high and more shares when they're low. You're cutting back on your purchases when they're high. It's kind of like going into a grocery store, right? If they kept marking up the prices at some point, you'd say, you know, I think I'll cut back here. So now it goes back to 10. And again, you cut back on your purchases. And then the, the next time you give me some money, it's at five and boom. That's 20 shares. Okay, so uh, we end up having a, a average share price here. If we take the 10, the 15, 20, 10, 5, that's going to be uh, 30, and we divide by 4. So I'm going to get on my calculator. I told you I'm terrible at arithmetic. So if somebody offers me a calculator, I say thank you very much, because otherwise I'm going to mess up. So I'm going to take 30. And I divide by four, and we find out the average price, the average price was 750. So we're here. And by the way, what I can do in my taxes, if I liquidate all these shares, that's kind of what kicked off this discussion, right? Is that my average share price was 750, but my average cost is going to be lower than that. Okay, so that we did that. We took 30 and we divided by four. And we came up with uh, 750. Okay, now let's see what we ended up paying. What is our average cost? So the way we do that again is we take what we've got here. Uh, we spent $400. Let's get a different color. And that $400 is acquired for us. Uh, 10 shares, 20 shares, 10 shares, 60 shares. So we're going to divide 400 by 60. And we find out that our average cost is 666, uh, sign of the devil, that's not good. <laughs> so that's our average cost here. Okay, so that's the end result. We said there's three test questions about dollar cost averaging. The three test questions are, what makes it work? Fixed dollars invested regularly. Sounds like the one you encountered was number two here. You end up with a lower average cost, $6.66, than the average share price, $7.50. Did they actually make you do that math? No. Okay. That's just a and the third thing doesn't guarantee a profit. Now, if we're not going to sell all these shares, so you know, you say, hey, Dean, which shares should I sell? I said, well, Sophia, I would suggest with the stock at five right now, we sell the uh, shares or mutual funds that we got at 10 so we can have a loss. And you say, well, gee, that sounds like a, that's a pretty nifty thing to be able to do. I go, yeah, that's called share identification. Now, the test question is, if we can't identify the shares, the IRS is going to impose upon us FIFO. That's testable. Whenever you get a tax question, you always want to answer what yields the most to the U.S. Treasury. Whatever yields the most to the U.S. Treasury, that is the right answer, right? So, you know, whatever you generate the most. So, it's testable to know that we can choose average cost, share identification, whatever we'd like. You know, if we want to choose average cost, we sell all of them. We could use this number if we wanted. But if we can't do it, we don't keep good records, the IRS is going to say, no, no, it's FIFO. Suitability. So why do people buy mutual funds? Why do people buy mutual funds? Well, we said they buy mutual funds for professional management, diversification, and ease of ownership. And we have as many different types of stocks as we have. That's how many different types of funds as we have. So we have growth funds, we have value funds, we have income funds, we have growth and income funds, uh, index funds. So uh, I'd say, you know, uh, I think it's a waste of time and energy and expenses to try and beat the market. I say, you know, what I believe in, Sophie, is called the efficient market hypothesis. 
You know, I believe that everything to be known about a security is known. And that means test question, I'm a good prospect for a mutual fund, index mutual fund, right? Where I'm accept, willing to accept a market-based return. Right? So, so they give you some song and dance about this person telling you they don't believe in the markets, uh, trying to beat the market, you know, and you would say, okay, well, let's get you an index fund. You know, uh, listen, you guys are a huge money manager, but so is Vanguard. And a big part of Vanguard's presentation is in a lot of their portfolios, they never underperform the market. And the reason they never underperform the market is because they are the market. It's an index fund and whatever the S&P does, that's what the fund does. Right? So, now, a specialized sector fund test question is the most aggressive fund we have because this specialty fund is diversified, but only within its specialty, whether it be precious metals, or I gave you an example of a specialty fund, the Mexico fund. Right? So it's diversified, but only within its specialty. So that's going to be the most aggressive one we have. Now, there's a fancy word for you know being aggressive and having lots of volatility. And so we would expect a specialty fund to have a higher beta. Beta is a measurement of a volatility. For example, what is the beta of an index fund? One. Should yeah, right on. Exactly, it's one. Right. We would expect the market goes up 10%. The index fund is going up 10% or vice versa, based on the S&P 500. Now, all active managers, all active managers are trying to do better than beta. And the return that's in excess of beta is called alpha. So, for example, if the beta is... Uh, one and the market went up 10, but my fund did 13%. I'd say, Sophie, I have 3% of alpha. You know, with a beta of one, you would have expected my fund to go 10 and it went 13. The three is the alpha, the excess return. Again, low probability. I think my beta is higher probability. You know, they'll say a measurement of a stock or fund's volatility is compared to the market as a whole is known as, and you got to come up with beta, right? So yeah. alpha, eh, you know. And as I recall, I don't think you have to go take a 66 or 65 anything, right? You're done after this, right? The 63. Oh, 63. Okay. Well, so you're not going to encounter any, you know, analytical portfolio stuff in after you go to the seven. And I joke, you know, I always tease people, you know, <laughs> you gotta you don't need to know this about crock because you got men and women who have PhDs in modern portfolio <laughs> theory, right? So you yeah. know, <laughs> there's a good there's a good place in between those men and women, and you know, and, uh, you know they're, 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 some of them are uh, geeky in a good way. I don't mean that as a derogatory term. They just need somebody to help them on the marketing side. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't think to tell this guy that he's really kind of clueless because he's so 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 smart. He ends up being pretty stupid on on some things. I was trying to think. I just gave up because I thought there's no way he's not going to interpret this correctly. Is like. You need some soft skills or people skills. Yeah. <laughs> For the case, maybe. Now, um, yeah. the one time the mutual fund is actually going to be more dangerous than the actual individual securities in a bond fund. Because remember, if you buy an individual bond, Sophie, if interest rates go up like they are now, I could say, well, Sophie, who cares if interest rates go up and our bond portfolio goes down because we're just going to hold it to maturity. But boy, in a bond fund, when the interest rates go up, the NAV of the bond fund goes down. And, you know, if we haven't sold this correctly, people are going to start redeeming. And then the manager is going to have to sell the bonds and have to uh, realize the risk. So in a bond fund, just like an individual bond, you have interest rate risk. Just like you would in the individual security. And remember, you're not in control of that portfolio of corporate bonds or that portfolio of government securities. Uh, we talked about municipal bonds. We said they have a comparatively low yield and usually safety of principal investment grade because, you know, people don't want to lose money in a tax-free mutual fund. And we said the dividends you're receiving from that tax-free fund are exempt because it represents the interest from the bonds. But if they sell the bonds and they have a gain, that capital gains distribution is going to be ta uh, ta uh, taxable. Money market funds, very testable. So I say, Sophie, uh, what do you want to do with your idle money here at my brokerage firm? I have two things you can do with the money, your cash. You know, if you like, we have available for you a traditional bank account. And if you have idle funds here at Morgan Stanley or Charles Schwab or, you know, Fidelity, we have a money market fund or a traditional bank account, your choice. You say, Dean, what is in a money market fund? I say, Sophie, that was on my Series 7. 
What's in a money market fund is high quality debt maturing in less than 12 months. Now, under the Investment Company Act of 1940, it's actually 13 months, but in you know practice, in the vernacular, people would say less than a year. And that means you go like what? And I go, well, that was on my Series 7 too. So what would we find in a money market fund? What are some of the things we would find in a money market fund? I bet you BlackRock's money market fund has got hundreds of billions of dollars in it. Right, because when a portfolio manager BlackRock sells a security, he's going to have cash. What's he going to do with the cash? He's not putting in a traditional bank account. I my my guess it's going to go into a BlackRock, you know, money market fund. So what would be in there? Are those like commercial papers? And right on. So let's just go slowly. So very testable commercial paper. You are correct. And commercial paper, you should know, is issued at a discount, and it has a max maturity of. 90, oh no, I forgot, 270 days. <laughs> yeah, you know, by the way, I'm asking you to pick things out of the stratosphere. And on the test, you won't have to do that, right? On the test, they're gonna, you know, it's gonna be in front of you. So I'm being kind of a jerk. And then remember, so this is uh, what uh, is issued by corporations, right? To finance their, you know, their activities. You know, Schwab, uh, I read my annual report of Schwab and they said that the treasury department of Schwab is allowed to issue $2 billion of commercial paper at any given time to fund the daily operations of Schwab. We're like, wow. You know? And again, that would be bought by a money market fund manager. Okay. So what else? So they got one. Um, bankers acceptance. Absolutely. Nailed it. And what are bankers acceptances? Test question used to do. Um, therefore imports and exports. That's right. Very testable. Facilitate foreign trade. I don't know about you, but when I take a test, I like it to get to the first question I know I know the right answer to. And I'm feeling really good about your session today because I think there's going to be, based on your performance, there's going to be some things where you're just going to go, oh, oh, I remember that. I got that. So, yeah. That was the hard yeah. thing about the last test is that I felt really good about narrowing it down to two. Yeah. I was like, I know it's between one of these two. And then it felt like every time or every question, I was like really struggling to under to figure yeah. out which was. Yeah, confidence is huge. Confidence is a, a th big thing. And as your tutor, I can tell you, you, you have no reason not to be confident uh, this time. I mean, the stuff you do know, you know. And so that's part of it too. Just not, not rolling into the 50-50 when you get bankers acceptances or, you know, commercial paper. This too has a max maturity of 270. Okay, what else? Um, like T-bills. That's the best, by the way, right? T-bills is the best, highest credit quality money market instrument. And T-bills, remember, are also issued at a discount. Okay, we're only missing one more. Zeros. A negotiable jumbo CD. Yeah. Oh, yeah, those are the always ones I forget. Those. Yeah. By the way, I like what you were saying, though. Jumbo CD, uh, uh, zeros are issued at a discount. All, you know, this could be an ABCD thing. What I mean by that is the only money market security that isn't issued at a discount is a negotiable jumbo CD, right? But uh, OID, OID zeros, that's, you know, different thing. So uh, there are no load. You have a check writing, so you can write a check against your money market fund. And then what the manager will do is just redeem whatever is necessary to make the make the check good, right? We have uh, global funds. We have international funds. We have mortgage-backed securities funds. So as many different securities as we have, that's how to mutual funds. I always joke when I'm teaching an open enrollment seven, you know, I say, if you really want to turn on your manager, just go back and say, I know I have a series seven, but it's okay if I just sell mutual funds. And they'd say, oh, that would be wonderful. You know, about 90% of what brokers need to be do can be done in the context of a mutual fund. Uh, suitability, so what we're trying to do here is match my investor's objective with that of the fund. So it's kind of like tender for mutual funds, swap right or left, right? So I say, well, what are you into? I say, oh, well, I have a fund that has that same investment objective. It won't be exact. You know, there are other managers, you know, that's their big thing when they're trying to compete against mutual funds saying, oh, wait a minute, you want a portfolio design just for you. And you know, so we're trying to get them as close as we can. So we have investment styles, growth, uh, value. The minute we say something about a fund's performance, we better be able to say in our sleep, past performance is not indicative of future results. I say, you know, Sophie, my crystal ball is broke. 
I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, but a lot of us use what are called hypothetical illustrations. So here's what they would look like had you invested in this BlackRock fund five years ago or 10 years ago. And you say, well, Dean, I would like to know what it's going to look like 10 years from today. And I said, well, I, you know, who knows that? Uh, sales load. What was the max for the sales load? 8.5%. Right on. Now, be careful. Again, RTFQ. If I ask you, what is the largest expense to a mutual fund investor? That's the load. But if I ask you, what is the largest expense to the fund? That's the investment advisory fee. Mm -hmm. So just be careful where they're asking about an expense to the customer, the load. That's not paid by the fund. That's paid by the customer. Now, I joke, there is a problem with having monkeys harvest bananas. And the problem is that they eat the product, right? So, you know, it's, you know, by the way, the more, more expertise I have, the more I'm going to charge you. And the expense ratio. Now, that's not the only way uh, to compare things, but, you know, we want to know how lean and mean, how much of the money is getting eaten up, right? So we're not going to make you do anything. We're just going to ask you to recognize that's one of the considerations in the fund. I say, Sophie, I like the fund because they're lean and mean. They have a lower expense ratio. I think it was like charities. You know, uh, my father is a uh, missionary and he has a, a, a orphanage called Sparrow's Gate. And I tell you, his expense ratio is zero because, you know, I have to tell him, Dean, my dad's name is Dean as well. I say, listen, nobody expects you not to, you know, have expenses, dad, you know. Now, sometimes I'll take him a nice dinner and he'll say, well, we could put this in the orphanage. I go, no, you're going to have a nice dinner. You're going to enjoy it. We're going to spend a lot of money. It's not going to the orphanage. But, you know, I saw some guy on TV telling me what he's going to tell me where if I sent him a dollar, where it would go. I said, well, I'm interested. My goodness, by the time he got done, it was like 30 cents in expenses. So only 70 cents got where he was trying to do something. And, and you know, I got a problem with this theology because I sent him a letter saying, you know, I think that's kind of outrageous that it takes you 30% expenses to get the money to where it's supposed to go. And and we said, well, it wouldn't get there without me. I said, now I got a problem with your theology. Really? God needs you to move money from point A to point B. Now I, now I got a theological problem with you. So it's not the only consideration. It's just one of the considerations when considering whether to buy a mutual fund. Uh, by the way, tenure is important as well because we want to know who to handle, hold accountable, right? So I joked, you know, Bill Gross has left the building. So a big part of the track perform uh, performance of the PIMCO funds is based on Bill Gross. Now, that could be good news or bad news. I can say, well, Sophie, that guy was gone. We got rid of him, right? So, you know, in other words, how much of that track record is, uh, you know, attributable to whoever it happens to be? In your case, it'll, I guess it'll be when Larry Fink leaves the building, right? Who knows when he's yeah. there. You know, that'll be a day where we'll say, okay, well, that was, you know, that was a good ride. Very testable. So, again, I'm just so pleased with your choice in terms of not doing margin and saying, let's do mutual funds, package products instead. So once again, we're in a very target-rich environment. So what I mean by that is the most target-rich we thing we did in our previous session was comparing and contrasting an open-end fund with a closed-end fund. And we said that's just hugely testable. Now we're going to contrast an open-end fund with an exchange-traded fund. And same deal, very testable. How are they different and how are they alike? Now, more often than not on your exam, they test, I like to ask, tell you how are things different, right? So that's going to be what they're mostly interested in. So ETFs are classified as open-end mutual funds. Who cares? Now, when I say who cares, I mean for test purposes. What we care about is they are continuously priced. So, Sophie, that means they trade like a stock. Remember, that is not true of an open-end mutual fund. Remember, the test question is, are, how are ETFs different from a traditional open-end mutual fund? Open-end mutual funds are not continually priced. Do you remember how open-end mutual funds are priced? Um, they're the NAV the next day. Right on. Based on the next calculation in AV. People don't like that. By the way, ETFs, the way I think about it, is there's some things that people don't like about open-end mutual funds. You know, John Bogle has died. I mean, he's passed on, but John Bogle is a legendary mutual fund guy. He's the founder of Vanguard. And he says, I don't know why people need ETFs. You know, mutual funds are fine. You know, listen, it's hard to, you know, he has an appendix of people who have mutual funds with him since he started Vanguard. And got a pretty good case, you know. 
but say, ah, John, you're just one of those old guys, man. That's no fun. They said one's per business day, next calculation. Now, uh, we as broker dealers used to be in charge of credit extension to our customers. And that was called the Roaring Twenties. Everybody had great fun. At the end of the Roaring Twenties, there was a crash. And we passed uh, 33 and 34 companion pieces of legislation. And 34 people in places said that uh, Reg T, that's part of 34, is going to be given to the Federal Reserve Board. So the Federal Reserve Board is the one who says what things can be purchased on margin and what things cannot be purchased on margin. Very testable. Under Reg T, new issues are ineligible. That's a fancy word. We're saying they are not marginable. And so remember, open-end funds are continually offering new shares to the public. And so that means you can't buy an open-end fund on margin. It's a testable. It's considered a new issue 30 days from the effective date. So that means if it's an IPO or an open-end mutual fund, after you've had it for 30 days, then you can actually you know, use it as collateral. So, you know, a couple of test scenarios here. So uh, I say, Sophie, I, I know we're doing the IPO and I know you have an indication of interest, but listen, we may not be able to get the stock through the primary distribution because who knows if we're going to be able to get to that allocation. So, but Sophie, what I want to talk to you about is we don't get it through the allocation process. It's going to be trading on New York and we can just do, you know, buy in the secondary market. So uh, let's talk about that. If we miss out on a thousand shares, we don't get an allocation of a thousand shares in the IPO. We'll just buy it in the next day in the secondary market in New York. And so I call you that day. It's now trading in New York. <clears throat> and I say, hey, Sophie, as I mentioned, you know, we didn't get the allocation we were hoping for. Uh, I'm getting ready to buy it. And you say, hey, Dean, do it at my margin account. I say, Sophie, no can do. I can't lend you money to buy a what? New issue. Now, another scenario, you call me up and say, hey, Dean, there's this company went public a while back. I'd like to buy it on my margin account. I say, well, Sophie, how long ago did it go public? You say, it doesn't matter. I say, it does. You say, two weeks ago? I say, can't do it. You can do it in your cash account, just can't do it in your margin account. Now, as it relates to an open-end mutual fund, you can't buy it on margin. But again, testable, contrastable point, ETFs can be purchased on margin. So we're talking about what you can do with an ETF that you can't do with an open-end fund. And you can sell short ETFs. You can't sell short an open-end mutual fund. So as we said, the test questions, this, by the way, I can't imagine a draw on January 9th where you're not going to get a distinction between an ETF and an open-end mutual fund. So we're still talking about this contrasting difference. I told you that uh, I don't have uh, tax control of my investments in the Fidelity Magellan Fund. As I told you, Fidelity owns 10% of Google. And so when they sell the 10% of the Google, who knows, they may or may not sell, but it's not my choice. There's going to be a huge capital gains distribution. And remember, I don't control that. If I own the Google in my personal account, I decide when to realize the capital gains tax. It's a transaction-based tax, right? So generally no tax expenses until you redeem the shares. I don't like to say sold, redeem. Uh, but ETFs, you're not like a mutual fund. Again, we're contrasting the point. An ETF is passively managed. You know, I'm, I should add for test purposes. There are actively managed ETFs, but for test purposes, they're passively managed. By the way, a huge part of BlackRock, as I mentioned, who used to be what was called Barclay Global Investors, and they were huge in the ETF business. And no surprise, guess who's number one in this space? BlackRock. You know, I'm sure there's probably five or six money management categories in which you guys are <laughs> you know, the top. It's not all it's cracked up to being, right? You know? <laughs> I, you know, I don't think you guys are part of the evil empire, but boy, I have some progressive friends. I'm like, oh my God, listen, guys, you know, th th that's, you just don't understand the business. You know? So uh, you probably have more of that problem in, in San Francisco. Anyways, <laughs> lack of annual distributions is known as the tax advantage over mutual funds. So they're more tax efficient. And so for the most part, since they're on autopilot, what I mean by autopilot, passive managers are going to have a lower expense structure and operating costs. 
you know, you know, you know, BlackRock can deliver this product at a lower, much lower cost than an actively managed mutual fund. And then you pay commissions to buy and sell them. So it's more, you know, it's more of a trading vehicle. ETFs are more of a trading vehicle than dollar cost average in a mutual fund. Now, I can't tell you how many times people on my YouTube channel will take exception with what I just said. And they'll say, oh, ETFs can be bought for the long term. I go, well, listen, that's not what we're looking for on Series 7. We're looking on Series 7 for an answer that says dollar cost averaging and an open-end mutual fund is longer term and, you know, day trading ETFs, maybe not so much. You know, you could own an ETF for the long term. But, you know, the person who took exception, I said, you know, let's do a poll and just ask people how long they've owned their ETF. I bet you if we took that poll and then average, there'd be people who have had mutual funds much longer than they've had their ETFs. All right, companies' uh, risks. Uh, we said, what are the benefits of mutual funds? Investment companies, you have a choice investment objectives. It's easier to own a mutual fund than individual securities. You know, I'm going to get, you know, if I have 10 securities, I mean, my God, I'm going to get 10, uh, 10, 10 Qs, 10, 10 Ks. You know, it's just easier. We talked about liquidity. Anytime you want, what can you do? Redeem. And within seven calendar days, with the next calculation of the NAV, poof, you got your money. Low minimum initial investment. Uh, we said that uh, some funds let you combine your purchases for purposes of meeting a break point. Some funds allow you to go from fund A to fund B without paying an additional uh, sales charge. Uh, PS, when you do that, it's a taxable event. So assuming you don't have this mutual funding or 401k, that would be a taxable event. Mm -hmm. These are what we call uh, market risk, systematic risk, right? We had this idea that even though you're diversified, risk still prevails. So market risk means even though you have diversified the uh, thing, you still have market risk. But market risk is also known as systematic risk, the tendency of securities prices to move together. And so, you know, here we're saying systematic risk prevails despite your diversification. So just by way of reminder, we said there's a test question about how to avoid unsystematic risk, selection risk, we said diversify. And then we said that the easy way to do that is a mutual fund, but you still have systematic risk. Interest rate risk uh, in a bond fund, right? Doesn't matter what bond you have, if interest rates go up, the bonds are going down, right? So you have interest rate risk in a bond fund. You have expense risk. Expense risk means, you know, you, they're charging you 30 basis points. Now they're charging you 50, they're charging you 100, who knows? And you have tenure risk. It depends on whether you have a celebrity portfolio manager. You know, some uh, funds have the celebrities and when they leave, you know, that's going to be a problem perhaps because the person who's responsible for that return, as I mentioned, this is either good news or bad news. It's just something that you need to consider, right? You know, tenure just means, you know, what, the American funds, for example, purposely does not have celebrity fund managers. Mm -hmm. And they use that as part of their presentation. That, listen, you're not buying some celebrity person. You're buying a team of people that are managing money. Fidelity has had legendary portfolio managers like a guy named Jeffrey Vinnick. And, you know, he says, hey, if you like me with all the constraints managing public money, you're going to love me with a hedge fund. You know, I'm setting up a hedge fund, $50 million investment. And then the idea here is now the Fidelity Magellan Fund is rudderless until we find the new, next Jeffrey Vinnick, you know, or whoever the next guy is. Um, <laughs> Be interesting to see, uh, uh, you know, Fidelity's business model. I, I've seen they're kind of getting a little away from their old celebrity fund manager kind of model because of <laughs> problems with that model. Bill Gross, right? Bill Gross, we talked about him. He's a celebrity kind of guy. And uh, we have, a, but who's your Kathy Woods? Kathy Woods is a person that has an ETF called ARC. And she's kind of a, besides being a fund manager, she's also a celebrity, right? She's on YouTube and you know, doing her thing. All right, let's clean that up. Rules and regs, rules and regs reporting mutual funds. So I just told you here, we're managing uh, public money. So when we're managing public money, there's a regulatory framework that we don't have when we're managing private money, right? So mutual funds are managing public money. Hedge funds are not, right? Hedge funds are set up specifically to avoid all the rules we're talking about. So uh, you can't buy uh, securities on margin in a mutual fund. The manager can't have a joint trading account. What we mean by that is if the manager is going to be trading with us as a Goldman Sachs and I'm doing business with the fund and the fund manager, 
I, he can't say, hey, Dean, just put it in this account and I'll decide where it belongs to the funder myself. I go, no, 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 no. You know, we need to have two specific account designations, one for you and one for the fund. Now, P.S., most funds would make the manager put his money into the fund so we don't have to worry about this. Um, for the purchase on any security on margin, this is not including ETFs? No, yeah, it does include ETFs. Yeah, but okay. ETFs can be purchased on margin. We're talking about a fund manager and an open-end fund. Okay. And a fund manager and an open-end fund buy securities on margin for test purposes. The answer is no. By the way, anytime I say for test purposes, it's a hint, Sophie, that in the real world, that's, you know, may not be true. But hey, we're in Series 7 Fantasyland. At least on January 9th, you get to leave Series 7 Fantasyland. I'm stuck here permanently. I never get to leave. No wonder I am demented. I can't wait to leave. <laughs> yeah, I, I, listen, I don't think it personal, Sophie. I, on my YouTube channel, it's so funny. People, when they, they you know, they have to take their SIE and their seven and their typically taking a 66. And so, you know, they'll subscribe to the channel and then they'll, tell, they'll send me a note saying, uh, hey, Dean, thank you so much. But, uh, you know, I have uh, made it through my exam, so I'm unsubscribing. <laughs> I go, hey, listen, if I'm losing subscribers, that's a way to lose them. And then I always joke now with people. I say, I come into your life for a reason and a season. The reason is to pass your exams and the season is how long it takes you to do that. Now, I've joked about that so much that sometimes people will now send me the opposite message. Hey, Dean, uh, I passed my exams, but I'm going to stay as a subscriber. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> we're, I remember we're not supposed to be uh, buying other mutual funds, right? So we, we were charging people to manage the money. So I'm not, what this is saying is that I shouldn't be owning 3% of another mutual fund. I'm supposed to be bar buying, you know, targeted kind of uh, uh, investments. I don't think you'll see that. I've never had anybody tell me they've seen that one. This is hard to believe that we could start our own mutual fund, Sophie, for a hundred thousand bucks. Watch out, BlackRock! Here comes Sophie and Dean. <laughs> you know, we need a hundred grand. We need a hundred shareholders. This was passed in 1940, so I can't believe they have not revisited this because there's so many exemptions available to somebody who has a mutual fund that, you know, sometimes I think to myself, it would be worth to have a mutual fund just to be able to avoid a whole bunch of stuff. Because <laughs> there's a, a, a answer to a lot of questions that, hey, I have a mutual fund. Okay. So, by the way, the, the exemptions are based for, you know, BlackRock or American funds or Oppenheimer. But, you know, 100 grand, I'm, I'm in the club. I'm in the club. Uh, audited financial statements to the SEC and financial statements to the customers, the owners of the fund, semi-annually. All right. We talked about this very testable. So, you know, we have what are called an approved product list at a brokerage firm. So if, you know, you're a baby broker, that's not a derogatory term. It's a term of endearment. And I say, uh, Sophie, here's our approved product list. These are all the different mutual funds you can get people involved with. And Sophie, what I would suggest you do is call a wholesaler, an associated person at Franklin Fund, Templeton Fund Distributors or American Fund Distributors. They have men and women who would love to take you to lunch and talk to you about why you should sell their fund. What are the advantages to their fund family? They can be very helpful. You know, I usually tell my baby brokers of the day, I don't have any baby brokers now, but I would say, listen, I would have made a past baby broker broker if I didn't have a wholesaler. You know, and these guys can, re they know how to sell things. I mean, they're, you know, and squared away. Now, if it's not on our approved product list, a couple of questions here. I can't sell it. I'm not allowed to get people involved in things that aren't on the approved product list. So, you know, one of the jobs of a wholesaler is to go find broker dealers that can, you know, that will sign up to sell, you know, their, their products. I can't imagine there's a broker dealer that doesn't have some kind of a selling agreement with BlackRock, right? Who knows? If they didn't, there'd be a guy at BlackRock who would go out and say, hey, why aren't you doing business with us? Okay, so it has to be in place to sell that. Now, we're not allowed to give concessions, discounts, or allowances to people who are not affiliated. So what we mean here is some mutual funds will allow reps and broker dealers to buy the fund at the NAV without the sales charge. But if anybody's not paying the sales charge, they have to be an associated person. In other words, we can't cut side deals to, you know, the public. If the public offering price is $10, unless you're an associated person, it's $10. And under no circumstance would it be less than the NAV. We talked about redemption within seven days. We talked about that. And the point is here, if you have buyer's remorse, this is a sign I didn't sell this to you correctly. Because now you're saying, Dean, I don't want to invest in the mutual fund. So I'm not going to get my commission if somebody redeems those shares with seven days. Concession is just a fancy word for the commission involved, right? So in my example, 
$9.15, $10, the sales concession would be like 80 cents of that. All right, well, we have completed mutual funds. Uh, insurance uh, products, uh, you're going to get cashed on variable annuities. Uh, how you feel about that? You want to do variable news, margin? What else is on your list? We still got about a 10 minutes here, and I'm more than happy to. Yeah. Um, I would say variable annuities, I am a little bit confused as to what is tested. I think like with insurance companies. Okay, I... let's go light screen. Pretty, pretty straightforward what's going to be tested. So good news. You know, you don't need to do anything beyond what I'm about to do on this whiteboard. Okay. So again, we're just trying to pass the test. So don't ever tell a compliance officer what Dean did in your tutoring session because they would be upset. But I think of a mutual fund at a variable annuity as a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. A mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. Now, the reason that language is helpful is because a lot of times these variable annuity questions aren't really variable annuity questions. They're camouflaged mutual fund questions. So let's start with a fixed annuity. So fixed annuities are pretty straightforward. I go to an insurance company, I give them a lump sum. You know, maybe I give them, uh, you know, $500,000. This money I've already paid taxes on. And I say, I want to turn this into an income stream. And they say, okay, here's what we'll give you every month based on this fixed annuity. Now I ask my insurance agent, how is this going to work? And they say, well, Dean, as an insurance company, we're going to take your $500,000. We're going to put it in the general account of our mutual fund. We're going to make investments. We're going to buy stocks and bonds and real estate. And we hope to make more than we promised you. You know, we won't be an insurance company long, Dean, if we don't do this math correctly about what we can expect to get off of the $500,000. But at the end of the day, that's not your problem. That's our problem. So first contrasting point in a fixed annuity that is a traditional insurance product and the investment risk is assumed by the insurance company. And so, you know, you come back to me and you say, Dean, I figured out what you guys have been doing, man. You've been, uh, you know, taking my money and buying stocks and bonds and real estate and making way more than you promised me. I said, well, I don't think I misled you about that. I mean, you know, are you willing to assume investment risk? So that's the first climb up the risk ladder. Somebody who says, I am willing to assume investment risk. And I say, well, if you are willing to assume investment risk, Sophie, what we might want to consider is a variable annuity. And instead of putting your money into the insurance company's general account, we'll take your $500,000 and we'll put it into a mutual fund, which is called a separate account or sub-account. This is just a mutual fund. And what you're going to be buying in this uh, separate account are what are called accumulation units. I think of it as a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. So well, how often do we have to calculate the value of an accumulation unit? Once per business day. You know, to say you have 6,000 accumulation units in a separate account intellectually is the same thing as saying you have 6,000 shares in a mutual fund. Now, in our example, you're giving me $500,000. And remember, that's money you've already paid taxes on. And so this $500,000 represents, remember, your cost basis. Anytime you turn money into an investment, oh, hold on, that's money. Mom was, I want to make sure mom's okay because she's been. I got mom a fall down button. She sometimes she, you know, worries me because she said this oh, morning, yeah. 
you know, I'm not feeling so well. I said, well, check in, make sure, you know, I don't want to ground her and say, don't go anywhere, but all right. So this is $500,000 you've already paid taxes on. And so that's non-qualified? That's, well, yeah, this is right on good question, right? So that's what non-qualified means. The only version of this that is qualified is where you're going to have a zero cost base is if you were an employee of a 403B or a 501C, right? Because those people get to use a uh, you know type of a tax sheltered annuity. And your point, they would have a zero cost basis. And for, that, for them, that means everything coming out is going to be taxable. All right, so I love that. I love that. So, you know, that's exactly right. Okay, so back to this version here. Whether it's a qualified plan, and I love your language, by the way, Sophie, it's test language, whether it's qualified or non-qualified retirement plan. In all qualified plans, qualified or not, the money is going to grow tax deferred. The money is going to grow, so the growth is going to be tax deferred. And the idea here is it's always better to pay taxes later than today. So remember, if you're in an open and mutual fund, for example, in your personal account, not a retirement account, in your personal account, remember, even if you reinvest the capital gains distributions or the dividends, you're still taxed on it. But here, you know, you say, hey, Dean, can I have my money? You say, no, you cannot. You say, well, that's a bad thing. You know, it's a good thing. You, you have no constructive receipt. You must reinvest. And since you must reinvest, that money is going to grow tax deferred. Now, in all qualified plans, if you don't want to pay a penalty, you have to wait till you're 59 and a half to get the money, right? Because if you get it before that, whether it's a variable annuity we're discussing now, qualified or not, or IRA, or 401k, you know, you're going to get a, have to pay a 10% penalty. But that's for all of them. And now all the money coming out that you haven't paid taxes is going to be taxed at ordinary income. Okay, so now you're 59 and a half. And you say, uh, Dean, uh, I'm 59 and a half. I say, yeah, it's been quite a ride, hasn't it? You say, hey, Dean, uh, what is now in the separate account? What is now in the separate account? And I say, well, I'm pleased to tell you that uh, we have experienced some growth over the years. And we now have $5 million in the separate account. Okay, now this is where it gets pretty testable pretty, pretty quickly. So there's a lot of ways to get access to that $5 million. You know, one way to do it is just say, Dean, I want a lump sum. You want all the $5 million. I say, well, Sophie, if I send you that $5 million, Remember, 500000 is money you've already paid taxes on. So you're going to have a capital, uh, ordinary income tax on four million uh, and nine hundred and whatever that is, four million, four and a half million dollars, right? So now you are, are slick. And you say, well, Dean, I didn't know that. And I go, well, that's my bad. I should have told you that. The other way you can get access to that is to say, Dean, I want to do a random withdrawal. And you say, Dean, send me the 500000 that I originally put in there. And I say, no can do, very testable. Remember we said, Sophie, you always answer what yields the most to the U.S. Treasury. So it's last in, first out. If I send you $500,000, that's the five hundred you already paid taxes on. Right? So you, you know, excuse me, the 500000 you have it. This is the last money in. You have 500 ordinary income. If you ask for a million... It's going to be 500 and 500. It doesn't matter. It's to the four and a half that you haven't paid taxes. Mm -hmm. right? So you're not going to get that 500,000 until you get all that money out of there. So that's one way you can go about this. So last money's in, first money's out if you do random. Now, another thing you can do, this is kind of nifty, is you can annuitize. You can turn this into an income stream that you can't outlive. That's pretty nifty. If you want, we can annuitize this and start sending you a monthly check. And you say, uh, hey, Dean, uh, what's my uh, monthly check going to look like? I said, well, the first month, your check is going to look like $1,000. 
But once you get that, uh, give me a call. And because uh, I want to talk to you about uh, how this check is going to be uh, moving around. You said, what do you mean it's going to be moving around? Well, I say some months, Sophie, you're going to get more than a thousand. Sometimes you're going to get less than a thousand. Sometimes you're going to get a thousand. But, you know, you get a monthly check. By the way, kind of cool. You can't outlive this. Now I say, Sophie, do you just want to be paid for your life and your life only? Or do you want to be paid for your life and maybe a joint survivor? You got somebody else that you want to get taken care of? You know, because you can choose different ways to get this money in terms of the income stream. But the one that gives you the biggest check, test question, is life only. That gives you the largest monthly check. That's when you tell the insurance company, you just want to be paid for your life and your life only. Now, by the way, that could be a good deal or a bad deal, depending on how long you live. I mean, as we joke, the you know, insurance company has actuarial tables and, you know, they'll look at your age and your sex. And as you're later, you're going to be paid less because we think you live longer. So guys get paid a little more because the assumption is we're going to die sooner, you know, and then how much is in there. So, you know, we don't have to do any of the math. Okay. So here we go with the first check. Now I say, now remember of that thousand dollars you're receiving, 10% of it is not taxable right? because 10% of that represents the 500,000 that you already paid taxes on. So in this example, we have what's called a 10% exclusion ratio. All that means is that, you know, you don't owe taxes on that. Okay, so you say, well, Dina, you were hinting about this check bouncing around. I said, well, yeah, I, I'm, you know, as we said, insurance companies, so we, we've been joking in our time together about math geeks. And there are no bigger math geeks than actuaries. Actuaries are, you know, 